Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jeffrey Moser, who is a fellow, uh, research fellow here till May. Uh, till the end of April. The, okay, end of April. Um, Professor Moser teaches at Brown University in the art history department. He's been there for about three years now, um, has taught at um, McGill before that, uh, Chuchang University before that, got a PhD at Harvard in 2010 on um, a, a topic that's rather familiar to people here uh, who have seen the design by the book exhibition. He's worked on antiquities collecting in the Song period, and he's got quite a big chapter on Ye Chung Yi, uh, the author of the Sanding Tu, in his dissertation. I believe he's going to uh, have a book come out on that topic. I believe so too. Uh, very <laughs> soon I saw there's a kind of nominal things, bronzes, schemata, and the hermeneutics of facture in northern Song China. Um, he has studied in Taiwan for many years. I've seen like six or seven years at least. He's worked at the National Palace Museum as a translator. And um, has been quite productive publishing mostly on Song material culture studies, but he's uh, unusual in that he bridges art history with intellectual history as well. So today he will be speaking to us about uh, a different project, somewhat different. It's still about archaeology and Song dynasty uh, intellectual culture, but he's presumably talking about an exhibition project mm. that might come out of this. Mm. Um, and about one of the influential scholars, um, antiquarians in the Song period, Liu Dalin, whose tomb and whose family's tomb uh, were discovered while he was researching mm. uh, his uh, dissertation. So without further ado, let me welcome Jeffrey Moser. So thank you. Very, can everyone hear me? So thank you, Francois, very much for that generous introduction. And uh, before I start, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone here at the Bard for uh, making this opportunity for me to be here as a visiting fellow possible. And it's been, I've really enjoyed the conversations I've had thus far, and I look forward to more conversations over the course of the next couple of months. Um, I also wanted to thank especially Laura Minsky for handling all of the technical and practical details with not just this talk, but my, my being here in general. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I'm going to proceed. And um, what I'm going to do today is talk about a work that is very much in progress. And it's in progress in two senses of the word. It's in progress in that I'm still very much in the early stages of developing my thinking about this material. And it's also in progress in the sense that the archaeologists who are responsible for excavating and cataloging this material, I'm supposed to do something here. Wait a second. The bottom one. The bottom one. All right. There we go. Um, and it's also um, a work in progress in the sense that the archaeologists who have excavated this material and, in the, and are in the process of cataloging it are still involved in that process. So um, for that reason, I have to beg your indulgence that the objects that I'm going to be showing you, the images that I'm going to be showing you, I've limited myself only to those images that have already been made publicly available. Um, and I've also limited most of my analysis to those objects that, um, and those objects and that information that has been, that is sort of out there in the public sphere so far. Um, the archeologists have been kind enough to share with me a lot of other things, but I'm gonna keep silent about that part for the time being. All right, so, um, in 2006, uh, customs officials at the border crossing between Shenzhen and the Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong apprehended a group of antiquity smugglers, and or apprehended a group, yeah, apprehended <coughs> antiquity smugglers, and in their possession found a collection of 89 objects, 
uh, that included these two very fine examples of Northern Song era Yaozhou celadon, so Northern style celadons produced at the Yaozhou kilns in Shanxi, um, both of which had rims covered with, in one case, silver, in the other case, gold. Um, and this is sort of a cat typical of the types of objects that they found in this larger group. Now, upon uh, interrogating these smugglers, uh, police were led to the northern Chinese province of Shanxi and to another group, the group of tomb robbers who had acquired the objects in the first place. And upon interrogating them, they were led here to this region. Now, what we're looking at here is a region that actually most of you have seen um, objects from at some point in your lives because here at the juncture of the Yellow River and the Wei River is the heartland of one of the heartlands of Chinese civilization. Um, this is the home of the famous Terracotta Army that I think everyone in this room has some experience of. Now, if we zoom in further, we'll see here the modern city of Xi'an located there. And then just up this valley uh, is the town of Lantian, the, ta the township of Lantian, where, the cemetery, where these objects were in fact found to hail from. And what archaeologists discovered uh, just outside Lantian on the hill overlooking the, overlooking the town um, was a collection of tombs, in fact 29 tombs, in a single family cemetery that was excavated then between 2006 and 2009 and constitutes the most complete family cemetery that's ever been discovered from the Song Dynasty. Now, in this tomb, or in these tombs, they found a number of very interesting objects, and the, but the object that most excited the scholarly community is this one. And the reason it was most exciting to the scholarly community is that, even though it's a relatively simple gray vessel made out of stone, um, it has a significant inscription on its surface. And that inscription, shown here in a rubbing, is a dedication to uh, a dead individual, and that individual is a guy whose name is Lu, followed by the honorific Jun Yu Shu, which is the by name of a man named Lu Dalin. Now, Lu Dalin is significant because he is a member of one of the most prominent literati clan of the Northern Song Dynasty. He, along with, he had six brothers. And four of these brothers achieved uh, sufficient success in their lives to warrant a collective biography of the dynastic history of the Song Dynasty, um, uh, which was written uh, several centuries after the fall of the Song. And uh, is, he was the youngest of these four most prominent brothers. The other, four, the other three brothers, Da Zhong, Da Fang, and Da Jun, um, all achieved, all passed the civil service examinations, the highly competitive civil service examinations, and served as officials in various regional and courtly capacities. Most famously of all, Lu Dafang was the chief counselor for eight years um, during the latter half of Zhezong, the Emperor Zhezong's reign, and this is essentially the highest political office, the highest appointed political office in the land. So we're talking about a family that in political terms was really one of the most elite clans in all of the 11th century. Now, uh, here's the Northern Song. Those are the dates of the Northern Song for those of you who don't happen to have them on the top of your head. Um, now these, uh, all of the members of the Lu family were belonged to a social group um, known that we typically refer to today as literati. Essentially, literati were an elite social group whose identity was predicated on a shared commitment to learning and specifically the learning of the Confucian classics, which I am not going to recite all of for you here today, but um, which uh, involve, uh, which include a variety of groupings of different texts um, that deal with everything from um, ancient history to uh, ritual, um, poetry, and so forth. Um, one, it's very dangerous to try to generalize over this enormous corpus of literature, but one consistent theme um, throughout the canon is a commitment to moral life, commitment to moral edification, um, cultivated and realized through ritual as the basis for social harmony and good government. Now, because they were literati, they wrote. And fortunately, a number of their writings survive. Um, Lu Dalin, specifically, even though he, was, he never actually served in office, he was the most um, productive, scholarly speaking, of all of the uh, 
um, of all of the members of the Liu clan, something that those of us who struggled with administrative responsibilities actually understand. Um, so in any case, uh, he published, uh, or he, he, his writings included um, commentaries on the Analects of Confucius, the Mencius, the Book of Changes, um, the Record of Rites. He wrote an account of uh, things that he had heard, a record of speech uh, given by uh, when he was studying under the great uh, Neo-Confucian philosopher Cheng Yi uh, in, in the latter part of his life. And um, his brothers were, there's some debate as to who was responsible for the text ultimately, but his brothers were, in addition to several other texts which don't survive, responsible for something known as the Lu Family Community Compact, which was actually a compact of uh, rules and guidelines for good, moral, virtuous, communal life. Something that actually I think it would be useful for us to think about reproducing as a tradition. Um, so, uh, now, if, if, the, um, if it was just for this rich body of surviving texts and the materials that were found in the cemetery, this would constitute one of the most important <coughs> collective bodies of texts and objects that we have for talking about the 11th century, because as many of you who worked on ancient periods of history know, it's incredibly rare to be able to find a rich body of texts and a rich body of objects that so closely align with one another historically. But in addition to all of this, most interestingly enough, Lou Dalin was also an antiquarian. And in fact, the family um, that he belonged to was filled with antiquarians. And so what does it mean to be an antiquarian in the context of uh, the 11th century. Now this is a subject that I know several people here in the room have worked on, um, so I'm not going to go into this in too much depth, but for those of you who might be a little bit newer to the subject, I'm just going to say a couple of quick words. So antiquarianism, sometimes referred to as epi uh, epigraphy in our, in our discussions of, um, of, of, of the Song, uh, is known in Chinese as Jin Shi Shui, the learning of metal and stone. Um, the four most significant books that are generally categorized together as examples of antiquarian learning in the <laughs> Northern Song Dynasty are these four that I've listed for you here. Ouyang Shou's Record of Collected Antiquities, Zhao Mingcheng's Records of Metal and Stone, Liu Chang's illustration, Illustrations of Ancient Implements from the Pre-Chin Era, and Liu Dalin's <clears throat> Illustrated Investigations of Antiquity, or the Kaogutu. Now, these are just a small subset of the total number of books about ancient inscriptions and ancient objects that were compiled in the course of the Song Dynasty. They're the four that happened to survive. Uh, Liu Chang's <coughs> preface is the only part of his text that survives, but the other three texts survive more or less in total. Um, now, these books are important also for the later history of the study of antiquity, for the later history of antiquarianism, insofar as they are the namesakes for terms that then become used in the early modern and modern periods as translations for Western language, or Western um, words like epigraphy, or English words like epigraphy, this being the translation, Jin Shi, metal and stone, is used as the translation for epigraphy, and Kaogu, is used as the translation for archaeology. So when scholars of Chinese archaeology, scholars of the history of the discipline of Chinese archaeology, talk about the history of their discipline, they typically cite Lu Dalin as the progenitor of their discipline. He is, in a sense, the father of archaeology in China. And as a, as a result, um, there's a sort of wonderfully postmodern quality about excavating his cemetery in that one is in the process of literally digging up the origins of one's discipline. Now, of course, what archaeology meant uh, in the context of the 11th century is very different from what it meant in the context of the 20th century. And um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today and trying to examine through both uh, some discussion of the text itself written by Lu Dalin, but then also a more general discussion about what was found in the cemetery itself and how um, thus scholarly life and material life intersect. So what I'm going to do as I proceed here is um, first talk a little bit about the scholarly life and then turn to the material life. And another way of thinking about that is to first talk about what we knew about the family prior to 2006 and then to talk about what we're knowing, we know about the family or can begin to postulate about the family based on the new information that's come forth since 2006. Now, now just as a few examples here, this is... Um, an example of the kind of objects that antiquarians in the 11th century were interested in studying. So these included 
um, rubbings of ancient inscriptions, such as the Mount E. Steely here, dated to 219 BC. Um, they wrote extensive colophons about these ancient inscriptions. Here's an example that survives in the collection of the National Palace Museum, the colophon to the Han Dynasty Huashan Steely of the Western March Mount, um, written by Ouyang Shou in 1064. And they also collected a large number of ancient ritual bronzes. These are offertory vessels that were used for making sacrifices to one's ancestors and to the spirits of heaven and earth. Um, and they illustrated them. Uh, this is an example of an 18th century reproduction of one of the pages of Lu Dalin's Kaogotu from the 11th century, 1092 is when it was finished. Uh, they identify in this catalog by Cartouche um, where the vessel came from, in this case from the collection of Liu Chang, another prominent antiquarian. And they also include examples of uh, rubbings from the surface of the vessel. This is, so what you're looking at there in the black box is uh, a Actually, to be completely honest, what this is is a, a 18th century inked reproduction of a woodblock printed reproduction of a rubbing. Uh, to give you a sense of the sort of cultural cachet of the rubbing and its significance. Um, so what you're looking at there is a reproduction of a rubbing from the surface of the bronze, of the inscription on its surface, and then below that, those, that's a transcription of the ancient script, the ancient orthography, into what was standard script um, from essentially the fourth century. Uh, now, they also participated more generally in a kind of archaistic archaism of material life. Now, this is something that I, I know everyone here is relatively familiar with, but uh, just as a very quick example, um, we know that from the 11th century on, the study of ancient bronzes and the circulation of ancient bronzes stimulated wide-ranging interest across a variety of different um, material to reproduce those forms in one sense or another, or to create new forms that in one way or another um, uh, were, were stimulated, uh, motivated, inspired by um, ancient, ancient bronze forms. And what we're looking at here is on the left a Western Zhou uh, Guevas or Dwe vessel, and on the right uh, a, an imitation of that style of vessel made also at the Yao Zhou kilns, also uh, in the 11th century, and is in fact um, based on its discovery in the Lu family tomb, one of the earliest examples, datable examples of Song Dynasty archaistic wares that has been found uh, today. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit here about the sort of some of the general views that we see expressed in the scholarly output of the Lu family. Um, and since I don't have other slides to show you, I'm just going to leave you this nice image. What you're looking at here is a, a line drawn reproduction of or illustration of an ancient bronze. Uh, in the Kaogotu, and on the right is an actual surviving ancient bronze in the collection of the Shanghai Museum. Now, these are not identical vessels. This is not, the picture on the left is not a picture of the bronze on the right. Uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, with one possible exception, none of the 800 plus bronzes that uh, were excavated and cataloged in the Northern Song Dynasty survive to this day. It's very hard for bronzes in a copper-based currency to regime to survive long above ground. Um, and many of the bronzes that made their way into early imperial collections were melted down for coins, unfortunately. But fortunately, we have the catalogs and so can study them through those catalogs. All right, so um, throughout their writings, the Lus express a clear and unqualified desire to revive the rituals of antiquity, those great ceremonies by which the ancient kings had regulated their families and by regulating their families had brought order to their countries, and by ordering their countries had harmonized all under heaven, or so legend had it. The commentaries on ancient liturgies and studies of ancient ritual objects written by members of the Lu family demonstrate that they cared a great deal about reconstructing the forms of the ancient rituals themselves. Now, however, it is important to stress that the family was not made up of strict formalists, they recognized that the traces of ancient ritual preserved in antiquities were inherently fragmentary and that it would never be possible to perfectly reconstruct every implement that the ancients had used and every liturgy that they had practiced. To be sure, it was important to endeavor to get the forms right, but what ultimately mattered was less the accuracy of the forms themselves than the sincerity of one's effort to recover them. On the subject of ancestral rites, the Lu Family Community Compact explicitly states that even if implements and vessels are incomplete, the ritual must be enacted with utmost sincerity. 
And here the term, the cardinal Chinese term is cheng, which is often translated as sincerity, sometimes as integrity. So the question then becomes, across these writings, in a world of ceremonial imperfection and ritual insufficiency, how was one to demonstrate to oneself and to others that one was sincere in one's effort? Now, in his various, various commentaries on the classics, Lu Dalin stresses that while cultivating one's internal sense of conscience and ethical reasoning, what he terms the rectification of the mind, had a part to play, while this had a part to play in the realization of one's sincerity, the mind alone was insufficient. Instead, he argues that sincerity was fundamentally embodied. And because it was fundamentally embodied, it was both cultivated and perceived in the realm of the senses. So how would one know if someone was sincere? Well, based on Lu's explanation, you would hear it in the tenor of their voice. You would see it in the graveness of their expression. You would feel it in their touch. And you would sense it in every movement of their body. Now, it's interesting that Lu ends his scholarly output with this catalog of antiquities. And we find in his discussions of these antiquities and in his preface to the catalog an, 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 an explanation for these antiquities that aligns with this broader set of um, philosophical speculation on the nature of, of sincerity. This is, in a sense, from his perspective, why antiquities matter. They allow one to experience the way of the ancient sages with one's senses. In his preface to the Kaogutu, Lu writes that looking at the vessels was like beholding the sages themselves. And he describes the appreciation of these vessels in terms of moral embodied self-cultivation. How do we come to know the sages and their way? How do we come to emulate them? Well, we see them when we examine the decoration on an ancient bronze. We hear them when we recite the inscriptions on their vessels or when we ring their bells. We feel them when we hold the vessels in our hands. From Lu's perspective, this kind of moral practice obviates the need for ethical reasoning. The ultimate goal was not to think, not to have to think about what was right and wrong, but to simply know what was right intuitively and he understood antiquities as tools for developing this kind of moral intuition. So ancient bronzes were not just models for new vessels, models for new ritual objects, but indeed catalysts for moral life. Now it's important to stress that this catalytic potency was not limited to the appreciation of antiquities. Any kind of embodied practice endorsed in the textual or material traces of antiquity, most notably the practice of ritual itself, was recognized as a method of cultivating moral sensitivity. Now this matters, I think, when it comes to explaining why some kinds of objects found their way into the cemetery, while others did not. And so here what I'm going to do is turn to what was actually found in the cemetery itself. And I'm going to work here in the opposite of the direction that one would normally work when they were discussing an archaeological site. I'm going to start with what was found in the tombs, and then I'm going to turn in my final comments to the construction of the tombs themselves. Um, now, Song tombs, and especially the Song tombs, the tombs of Song literati, and this is an important point to make as a, as a sort of prefatory point to thinking about any tomb space uh, in this period, were highly intentional places both in terms of their construction and in terms of the assemblages of grave goods placed therein. Sung Literati wrote extensively about how, to bury their, how one should bury their dead. And it's in fact quite interesting to discover that they disagreed vehemently about different ways of burying their dead. Su Shu will say that the people in Sichuan do it the best way. The people in, in, in Shanxi will say that the locals in Shanxi do it right. Everyone says that the peasants do it wrong. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a consistent debates. So we have actually a re really rich body of text for thinking about how tombs were understood in the context of 11th century cultural and intellectual life. Um, so these were sites for which and about which a tremendous amount of writing was produced. Uh, they were negotiated spaces where different attitudes about the appropriate ways to bury one's dead were expressed and in the process social identity and group affiliation was managed. Now the tombs themselves, the reason what you can see here, this is a map produced by the, or a diagram produced by the archaeologists, what you can see here is that the tombs are all numbered. 
um, and that underneath each of those numbers is a set of two or three characters. Now, for those of you who don't read Chinese, that's the name of the individual who's buried in the tomb. And the reason that we know the names of all the individuals buried in these tombs is that virtually every tomb in the cemetery was accompanied by an extensive tomb inscription. This is the covering stone. This is the inscription itself. Um, and so this biographical information, largely biographical information that can be gleaned from these inscriptions is, has dramatically expanded the amount of textual material that we have to talk about the Liu family and has allowed us to reflect more critically on the way, some of the ways in which the Liu family was represented in later historical literature. There's, uh, there's a really interesting aside here that I could take about um, why the, the, the writings of the Liu family survive. They have a lot to do with what was going on in the 12th and 13th centuries, but I'm going to leave that for the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, um, and I'm going to turn here to, to the grave goods. Now, a, a total of um, more than 600 uh, individual or sets of objects were discovered in the tombs. Um, you're looking at examples of one of the tomb spaces there on the left. Um, an example of some of the tomb objects that have been found actually sitting there, what you're seeing them is they're actually seated on top of one of these uh, tomb inscriptions. So it gives you a sense of the size of the stone upon which the inscriptions were carved. Um, okay. And the objects in the, and I'm here, I'm just gonna run through quickly, um, a sort of the range of different kinds of objects that were found in the tombs so that you, or in the, in the cemeteries, you have a sense. Uh, they include examples of um, carved uh, Yaojo wares, these green, northern green celadon wares. Uh, you're looking at a tea caddy there on the right hand side. Uh, examples of Jijo black wares from southern China uh, with oil spot decor that you see there on the left. Um, white wares, northern white wares. Uh, more, another example of a celadon tea bowl on a black ceramic uh, rest or base. Um, re beautiful, truly beautiful museum quality. Uh, examples of carved celadon, uh, or with, with celadon, celadon vases with carved decor. And so that they're, they're what you're looking at are designs that have been incised into the vessel's surface and then covered over with clear glaze. Um, another example of white, northern white wares, uh, drinking vessels, uh, incense burners, teacups, silver cosmetics bo cosmetic boxes, more examples of um, celadon, celadons with metal rims, the most sort of esteemed and valued examples of these kinds of wares in the 11th century. Uh, a really fascinating group of stone wares made from locally sourced, what's known as Li Shan Shi from Mount, uh, Mount Li, um, which, uh, are, which were actually very, um, sparing and austere in design, and these appear to have been made exclusively for use in the tomb as grave goods, whereas most of the other objects were most likely used by the, um, by the, the deceased when they had still been alive. Um, and then, most interestingly of all, uh, ancient bronzes that the family had discovered, collected, and then placed in their tombs. So you're looking at an example of a Western Zhou dynasty, so early first millennium BC, a Gui vessel on the left, a Han Dynasty, you get late first millennium BC, early first millennium uh -huh. AD, um, Ding vessel on the right, uh, examples of jade, ancient jade bee discs um, at Tong Dynasty, uh, incense burner, and most interestingly of all, from the tomb of Lu Zhishan here on the far side of the cemetery, uh, three bronze vessels, two from the Han Dynasty, one from the Tang that bear inscriptions. And these inscriptions are written in ancient script, so the ancient bronze or early seal scripts, um, but they were carved by the Lu family themselves. So they were cold wrought onto the surfaces of the older pre-existing ancient bronzes. And across these three vessels from this same tomb, we find three inscriptions and those inscriptions in terms of their content are essentially identical. They say on the Renshen day of the 11th month of Zheng He era, or 1111, um, orphan son Lu made this ewer or basin or coffin, that's the one word that changes across the three inscriptions, on behalf of his father, the gentleman for discussion for placement in his grave. So what can we say about these inscriptions? 
Well, first of all, um, what's interesting is that they echo the inscriptions on ancient bronze vessels. Um, it's clear that the family is emulating a practice that they learned directly from ancient bronzes themselves. The Confucian classics that purport to describe the ritual order of antiquity have virtually nothing to say on the subject of inscribing vessels with commemorative inscriptions. So this is a practice, a new practice that has been learned from the objects themselves, ancient bronzes themselves. Now at the same time, the Liu family, the persons responsible for these inscriptions, have clearly updated the content. Now as Xu Yahui and others who have examined these inscriptions have commented, several aspects of their content attest to their 12th century date. Now these include obviously the date itself, um, but also the use of the acronym Guzi, or orphaned son, and the specification that the object be made for placement in the grave. This is terminology that we don't see in ancient bronze inscriptions. Now, the inscriptions were um, written in a mixture of so-called Qin style, or early imperial formal script, or Zhuan Shu, and earlier lesser known bronze scripts. Now, this makes them challenging to read, even for specialists today, and certainly would have presented challenges to readers in their own day, even those who were accustomed to studying and appreciating ancient bronzes. Now, the co-presence of these temporal markers, the intrusion of contemporary diction into an archaic format, and the simultaneity of both pre- and post qin scripts have generated palpable consternation among the small community of scholars interested in the Liu family cemetery. Now, the handful of comments that have been written made thus far about these inscriptions attribute their polytemporal qualities to circumstantial forces. They suggest, for example, that the inscribers wanted to exclusively use the ancient pre qin script, but because of the corpus of examples from bronze inscriptions were limited, they had to resort to better known post qin style scripts for those characters not represented in the bronze inscriptions. Now, to my mind, what these readings assume is that Song intellectuals thought about anachronism the way modern epigraphers do. Um, but of course, the very nature of this practice of reinscribing ancient objects uh, should remind us that the operational mindset here is rather different from that of contemporary epigraphers and scholars. We don't, by and large, go about reinscribing the bronzes in our collections. Now, indeed, when we look closer at the inscriptions, we find a number of fascinating details. And the key one that I'd like to highlight here is that although the inscriptions are purportedly identical, there are actually um, uh, small variations in the orthography of a couple of the individual characters. So while the content is consistent, the orthography varies. And I can show that by looking at these two examples. So um, when we consider matching characters in matching positions, we discover that the character Shun, uh, which is part of the sexagenary date, um, shown above, and the character zuo, which means to make, is shown below, are written in two different ways, and that these different ways do not map consistently onto the same vessels. The character shun uh, is written using standard Qin-style orthography on the ewer and the cauldron, as is the character zuo on the cauldron, there. But on the basin, both characters written are written in a more archaic bronze script, as is the character zuo on the ewer like that. The bronze script versions of Zuo are also reversals. Now, although the directionality of the versions in the green boxes corresponds to most examples on ancient bronzes, there are examples of reversals like this in the bronze record. Now, most notably and interestingly, in the inscription on the ewer in the collection in Liu Cheng, which you can see right there which matches almost identically the way they were inscribed on the ancient bronzes, or on the, they were, the way they were inscribed by the Liu family. As you can see, the alignment of the characters is consistent with what we see on these bronzes from the cemetery. Now, to my mind, it is precisely this quality of flipping and interscriptural amalgamation that is the key to unlocking the ways in which these scripts were understood, why they were used, and what those who used them were intending to ac accomplish. And to get at this sets of meaning, I have to turn to another text that falls outside the corpus of the Liu family archive, but uh, is significant. And this is attributed to a very famous 11th century calligrapher named Tsai Shang, who in his judgments on writing tells us this. The key to learning calligraphy lies in grasping the spirit. If one copies the image, copies just the formal appearance, 
Though the characters are formally similar, they will be without spirit. This is what people who do not understand calligraphy do. I once saw the stone drum inscriptions and adored their archaic quality. Their schematic forms contain the residual thoughts of the ancients. It was when I obtained the inscription of Uncle Yuan's Ding Cauldron that I realized that in the Zhuan script of antiquity, one could add to or reduce the number of strokes or flip the character left or right, up or down. The appearance was based solely on the writer's intent and could be refined or awkward. Now, since the Qin and Han dynasties, the script has been fixed into a single form. Thus, what was seen in ancient writings came to an end. What a pity. So for Taishan, what matters about ancient scripts is not the forms of their graphs per se, but the creative possibilities that they enabled. Unlike later men, whose expressivity was constrained to fixed logographs, the ancients expressed themselves in writing that was truly ideographic, a flexible template of forms whereby they inscribed the movements of their minds. Those who mimetically reproduced ancient forms missed the point entirely. For Caishang, the principle of ancient writing was its endorsement of creativity. Now, what's interesting is how consistent this mode of antiquarian creativity is with Lu Dalin's vision of the moral potency of ancient bronzes. By appreciating ancient forms, one, from Lu's understanding, imbibed the way of the sages that brought these forms into being in the first place. In writing ceremonial inscriptions as they had written ceremonial inscriptions, creatively varying the characters as, one, as they wrote. One practiced ritual as they had practiced ritual. The object of reproduction was the embodied act of writing itself. And the key was not to write what they wrote, but to write as they had written. Given the ideal similarity between the sagely body that brought the ancient forms into being in the first place and the sagacious body that was writing them in the present, it stood to reason that there would be similarities in the forms so produced. But the key was that these formal similarities were secondary. Sagely action was about the practice, not the product. By absorbing a sagely state of being, the practitioner transcended the temporal gap between antiquity and the present and behaved in a way that was right precisely because it was neither exclusively of the past nor exclusively of the now. Only the ignorant saw the practitioner's actions as archaic. For those practitioners who understood what they were doing correctly, their actions stood outside of time. Now, what is to me fascinating about this sense of timelessness, this collapsing of antiquity and the present, is that it is wrapped up with a remarkable attention to materiality. And we see that materiality when we look at some of the other inscriptions on vessels in the cemetery. So, Whereas when they were inscribing bronzes, ancient bronzes, they used archaic forms of the script, when they're inscribing other more contemporary objects, such as this inkstone that's been inscribed with a similar commemorative inscription for another member of the family, they use more quote unquote modern standard forms of the script. In this way, the, the reading of the script and the writing of the script calls attention to the materiality of the object upon which it is inscribed. Um, another way that we see this attention to materiality is in the incredible subtlety of a number of these objects. What you're looking at on the right-hand side is a inkstone where the natural striations of the rock, the pale tan color and the darker brown color striations of the rock, have been mobilized such that as the um, individual grinding the inkstone grinds away the inkstone in the flat or in the flat depression, or the slightly slightly depressed area. Uh, at, the, at the forefront of the inkstone, they literally grind away the yellow surface of the stone to expose the darker brown stone underneath, drawing attention, very much attention, in that sort of embodied practice, um, that haptic practice of, of uh, grinding the inkstone to the nuanced visual qualities of the natural layering of the rock. Uh, the Li Shan stone object, the, the bowl that you're seeing on the left-hand side, uh, Lishan is fascinating. Lishan stone is fascinating because it includes, which are something that's entirely impossible to reproduce in photographs, uh, tiny, it, micros, almost microscopic inclusions in the stone that are translucent. So that when you hold this vessel up to the light, little tiny pockets of light seem to glow through, through the stone. Again, suggesting a, a, sort, of, a sort of object that w w w would reward very careful, close contemplation. Um, sometimes, this attention to materiality um, 
so the formal subtlety involves close representation. And sometimes this attention to materiality also invokes the experience of other senses. Now, this happens both practically, because many of the objects were specifically designed to hold things that one would experience with one's other senses, that things that would be tasted or smelled. Uh, incense burners, in the case of the object on the left, inviting olfactory sensation. Uh, tea caddies, inviting gustatory sensation. And in fact, in a number of cases, um, some of the objects in the uh, cemetery have included actual physical materials like tea and uh, cosmetics and uh, incense and so forth. Um, um, but this process also happens synest synesthetically when the qualities accessible to one sense encourage consideration of qualities accessible to another. Uh, for instance, in the case where carved designs on decorative vessels invite touch. Now, the tombs are striking not only for what they contain, but also for what is absent. We do not see here representations of the world of the living. In fact, we don't see representations at all. The tomb figurines and the murals and the faux architecture that, that proliferates in other kinds of Song tombs is entirely absent. Instead, we have the actual objects of life, objects that were sensorily experienced by the dead, departed, and the living who remain. They are not representations of a life lost, but actual physical accoutrements of that life, the elegant things with which the dead had once refined their senses of sight and hearing and smell and taste and touch. Now, when these objects are understood in the context of Ludalin's theories of embodied self-cultivation, it seems reasonable to, to conclude that they were understood as moral instruments, as physical traces of the sensorial processes by which the dead had cultivated themselves in life. In this more general capacity, they were not categorically different from the antiquities that the family buried in the cemetery. Like those antiquities, these more contemporary objects were morally edifying. By using these catalysts for moral transformation in the process of burial, the family not only ensured that their rites were reverent and edifying, they also gave unto their dead the means to continue the practices that had made those dead so pra praiseworthy in the first place. The grave goods, in effect, generated the ethical object toward which the ritual order as a whole was directed. And we see that also, in most interestingly, in the construction of the tombs themselves. And that's how I'm going to end up my talk today here, with a few brief comments on how these tombs were actually made. Um, now, the most remarkable thing about these tombs, is, there's two things really, but the most, the most striking is their depth, their incredible depth. Now, what you're looking at here, here, here's a sort of shot down from inside one of the excavation pits at the two adjacent tomb chambers where a man and his wife were buried side by side. And what you're looking at here is the actual excavation pit. Now the tombs, let's see if I can get this right. These is the actual tomb space. This is the shaft that was excavated when the tomb was made, tunneled down into the earth from which the, the tomb chamber would be constructed. And all of this other surrounding material has been created or surrounding area has been removed by the modern archeologist to get down to the tomb space itself. So in other words, these were very, relatively small tomb chambers that were accessed, accessed by very, very deep, narrow shafts. Is that stone or is that earth? So this is, this is lus, so it's earth. Uh, lus is a, a, an alluvial, a, a sedimentary soil that's found across North China, um, which actually, as you can see here, maintains its structural integrity when it is cut in uh, uh, vertical sections. So let me proceed here. Now, this stands in contrast to what we find in most examples of relatively elite uh, Song tombs, which are very frequently made uh, in imitation of timber frame architecture with elaborate brick structures, as you see here. Um, and uh, sets up a contrast between uh, what would be understood in the sort of the parlance of classically focused discussions of burial in Song China as a contrast between what's known as hozang or sumptuous burial and bozang or austere burial. Now, bozang was typically for, for the sort of Confucian purists among the literati was preferred. The idea that one would, as Confucius had, simply put the naked corpse into a depression in the ground, and that was the end of it, not to, do, not to create elaborate tomb spaces for honoring the dead. So at a basic level of the sort of under, central construction, we can see them practicing this, this, an understanding or interpretation of this notion of austere um, burial. But 
Um, what is a little bit harder to get our heads around is why they dug so deeply. I mean, we all know that you only need about six feet. And in fact, most of these tombs were excavated, or at least the, mo the, the most important, most significant tombs from the third and fourth generations of the family were excavated to a depth of nearly 10 meters in many cases. Now, for anyone who's ever tried to dig a narrow shaft to a depth of 10 meters, you understand how much labor is involved in this and how precarious the one's existence would feel when they moved into the tomb chamber um, at the very bottom of this shaft to place the dead. But what you're looking at here is another cross section. There you can actually see the area of earth that's been filled in. So this is the, the um, in the 11th century, they excavated this shaft, they built this tomb chamber, they filled the shaft back in with earth, and then the archeologists came and excavated this surrounding area in the, 20, in the 21st century. Okay, uh, that shows you where the shaft is. Another example. Probably the most extreme of all. You can see quite clearly here in the, in the strata, in the stratigraphy, this is the disturbed soil that had been farmed along the surface, and then all of this is historical um, earth. This, this, this is probably the level, roughly, um, that would have been there when the tombs were initially constructed. So that gives you a sense of how, how deep it was, even in the context of the 11th century, when they were made. Now, um, at its most fundamental, the antiquarian burial practice witnessed in the Lou Cemetery involved the placing of bodies and things deep inside the earth. Now, I refer to the logic behind the way they placed these bodies and the things they chose to place with them as a geologic because of what it suggests about the understanding of the geologic fabric of the earth and specifically the understanding of the, temporal the temporality of that fabric. Now, nowhere else in the Song archaeological record do we, to my knowledge, find tombs excavated to such depth. What we do find, where we do find tombs at such depth, remarkably, is during the late Shang dynasty and the early Western Zhou dynasty, from which all of the bronzes that the Liu family was collecting came. The ancient dynasties 2,000 years earlier that had been the objects of such interest on the part of the Liu family antiquarians. Now, my sense is that the Liu family recognized that there was a correspondence between the antiquity and the depth of these ancient tombs. Now, I should say that throughout the antiquarian writings that we find from the Song Dynasty, there is very little discussion of the actual process of excavating anything. At most, they will talk about where an object was recovered, but they don't go into detail about the context in which it was recovered, the circumstances of its recovery, and so on and so forth. This is most likely because they often didn't know that these had been objects that had been chance finds by local peasants that had then um, found their way into more elite collections. Um, but they don't display a significant interest in this, at least as far as we can tell from their writings. And I think what's striking about this cemetery is that it suggests that there was actually some awareness of the kinds of spaces from which these bronzes that they were collecting came. Um, that there was a sense of a connection between the physical location of the subterranean space from which the ancient bronzes came and the temporal location of antiquity. Now, I'm not sure if it's fair to call this understanding truly stratigraphic in the sense that relative depth is understood in modern archaeological sense as a measure of time. But it does suggest that the creation of, an, of the subterranean space wherein the time of the ancients and the time of the excavator coincides. And to talk about this one last example, I want to show this is a cross section of Lou Dalin's tomb itself. Um, and what you can see here is the tomb <coughs> shaft on the right hand side the tomb chamber uh, here. And then interestingly, above that, two other chambers. Now, these two other chambers have, spons have uh, sparked a great deal of uh, debate and interpretation. One suggestion is that they were meant to ward off tomb robbers, that the idea was that if you dig into this tomb and discover an empty chamber, you will assume that somebody got there first and, and go and look elsewhere. Um, uh, it's true that in the 11th century, the uh, literati in the 11th century recognized that tomb robbing was a problem. For centuries, actually, Huang Fumi in the 4th century specifically notes that there, are, there was no one in the world who did not die, and there was no one's tomb who was not, that was not disturbed. So um, it's clear that, that there was a very clear awareness of the problem of tomb robbing, um, and uh, it's clear that 
literati knew that many of the bronzes that they collected came from old tombs. Now we don't, we don't, as one might expect, see great amounts of sort of moral rumination on the problem of robbing the ancients to study their practices. But nonetheless, it does appear that they had some sense of, um, some sense of the fact that the ancient bronzes actually came from tombs and were aware of the problem of uh, tomb robbing. Uh, here's, so here's this, I didn't need the pointer in the first place. Here's, here's the arrow showing the shaft. Here's the actual tomb chamber, and those are the two false chambers above it, possibly. Okay. So in closing, this has just been some sort of general remarks about some of the ways I'm thinking about this space. Um, this year's theme at the Bard Graduate Center is distance. And what I would say in reference to that theme is that there, if there is one consistency in the design and contents of the Lou Family Cemetery, that consistency is the way in which all aspects of the cemetery from the grave goods, to the inscriptions, to the construction of the tombs themselves. Work in tandem to erase the distance between antiquity and the present. To align the ancient practices of death with the contemporary art of burial. And uh, in the process, to reactivate the moral order of antiquity in the life ways of the contemporary family. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was um, incredibly interesting with lots and lots of new ideas. And uh, even connecting to our theme of distance, uh, I, I had no idea how deep down these tombs were mm. dug. And I wonder whether you have any um, alternative explanations of those empty chambers. Mm. As Besides, be, be, besides warding besides out tomb the, robbers. To, I mean, it's interesting because modern tomb robbers were the ones who found the cemetery yes. as well. <laughs> yes, that's right. I didn't realize they would go this far down. And how, how in the world? Um, but so, do tomb robbers find a cemetery that is 10 meters So, 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 so it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think one of, the things, one of the things that, one of the reasons that so many places in northern China are robbed is that, um, as you can see from this image, once soil, once the loose uh, sediments are <coughs> disturbed, you can actually see them quite clearly in a cross section. And it's quite easy to cut a cross section. So I think that if you were excavating, you could excavate a, a pit here to a depth of one meter, right? Once you get down to this point where you see that distinction between the quality of the soil here and the quality of the soil there, you're aware that there's a shaft there. And once you find a shaft, it's a good reason to start digging. Yeah. Um, but it is, it, it is, this, this was an area, of the, my understanding is that when the tomb robbers, whenever the tomb robbers broke in, at some point probably in 2004 or 2005, uh, it was an area that was protected by an orchard. So it was actually possible to work there theoretically for an extended period of time while hiding your work relatively easily. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, know, you, could, you were concealed under the foliage. Um, the, the, the tomb robbers are, were local. In fact, interestingly enough, one of them apparently was a member of the Lou family. <laughs> um, a, a distant, you know, a distant collateral line of the Lou family. Uh, which actually raises very interesting questions about who should own the past. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, the Chinese, the modern Chinese state thinks that it should own the past. And so that's, that's, where, uh, that's why the things were in the collections of an archaeological institute and uh, in the museum today. Um, but in answer to your specific question about the false chambers, um, it's interesting. You know, we don't see this in every one of the tombs, to my understanding. Um, and in fact, uh, it's really in... One, one thing that I should have mentioned early on is that within the cemetery itself, the, the tombs are divided into five generational ranks. So you can actually follow five generations of the family. They, are, they organize the family into these five, five generations spatially. So there, there are, there's a way to sort of spatialize the temporal relations between the family members. Um, and the, uh, we don't see this depth and this elaborate sort of sub subsidiary room construction. Um, in all of the tombs. It's really in tombs from the third generation on and of the tombs of the most significant family members based on what I understand of the information that's been made accessible to me. Um, I think that one other possibility is that when you actually think about the, uh, the time and the effort involved in moving objects in and out of these spaces, that you would need other chambers. It's possible that those other <coughs> chambers were used for other rituals that were associated or that the objects were placed there for some sort of ritual function in the context of the burial uh, and that prior to being moved into the, into the final chamber below. We know often in other accounts of funerary practices that, that, that funerals were staged processes that sometimes were, uh, spanned um, 
multiple days, multiple weeks. So it's conceivable that they had additional ritual functions. Um, but beyond that, it's hard, to, it's hard to know. I would love to hear speculations if anyone has any, any, any ideas or suggestions. Yeah. I, I don't want to speculate about this, but I just wanted to come back to your, your kind of concluding point about the distance, which is, is super interesting. Um, and if I follow your, your, your logic at the end, you're suggesting that the idea or the goal of many aspects of this family's cultural work was to collapse the distance, mm -hmm. right? And to suggest mm -hmm. that the past isn't the past and that it's always existing. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what comes out in the idea of communion with the ancients through the objects, that they're somehow present. But I just yeah. wonder, when you throw in these tombs, I mean, it gives me a slightly different angle on that, and maybe it's just a question mm -hmm. of interpretation, but <coughs> it strikes me that, that this evidences an awareness of distance and that you know another possible explanation for this might be a kind of desire to get back to something distant and and I mean maybe that's a small distinction but I just would love to hear you speculate because you know the cultural patterns of, of thought about where the past is located where the past lies. And that yeah. I, I just see, I, I, I like the big picture, but I see nuances within the things that you're grouping. Yeah, uh, fair, fair point. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, I would say that where the past is located is a subject of intense debate in the 11th century. Mm -hmm. So there are those who would argue that we should look to historical examples. We should study history. We should, we should learn essential principles and then understand how different periods put those into practice and think in terms of history. Think in terms of time stretched out, um, and and of, of uh, different historical instances of um, certain moral principles, political principles. And was the idea to bring that into the present in the present time and space? So that's one. You know, what I'm saying, not necessarily. So that's one argument. There's another argument that becomes particularly prominent among the Neo-Confucians, which is to say that everything that's happened between the time of antiquity and now was wrong, and we need to get rid of it, and we need to go back to the ancients. In a, sort of, in a sort of radical way of overcoming the rupture of history, so to speak. And in that sense, in that kind of discourse, what is ancient is the, that the ancient, the Chinese term here is gu, is uh, both in the ancient past but also synonymous with the good. So anything that anyone does in the present that is recognized as good is also, by definition, ipso facto, ancient. Um, and so I think that, that, and that's very much, that idea is very much what's informed as you can hear my, my interpretation here. So to my mind, the, this digging to this depth, if they recognize that depth is where the, physically where the physical remains of the sages are, then what they're trying to do is put their objects where the sage the objects were. And so there's a recognition, I think you're right, there is a recognition of a, of a gap between the present that lives on the surface of the earth and the ancient past that lives deep in the earth. But I think that by in the idea that when one dies, one actually takes their dead and puts them, those those dead from the 11th century, into that ancient time. I guess it creates to, a kind of a kind of a is bridge. Is that trying to get us down there, or is it trying to get down there up to us? So I just I just I, you know, it's, a question. I it's a good that's a good I'll think about that. Uh, I would say both. Both. I would say both. And I think that's also the both ways is is. Uh, is seen also in the objects themselves. The fact that they're putting ancient antiquities in there and they're also putting contemporary objects in there. Right? They're there collapsing that distance. Yeah. Jeff, that, that was great. Uh, very enjoyable. I'm just wondering, the, the sort of the, the thinking uh. about time mm. that is represented by the work of uh, inscribing and reinscribing and of deposition. Mm. Is this, is this, um, would this be a source for us to try and understand some thinking about time? Or were, were the Lu, were the members of the Lu family themselves reading other discussions of time and translating those philosophical discussions into this material practice? So, so what I <coughs> that's, a, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to address it in two parts. The first part, as I understand it, is the question is, is the Lou family, is the Lou family in some way representative? Could, could we use these practices as a way of getting at something more general about the song? Mm -hmm. and, and I think my, the way I would answer that question is that they're representative in the sense that they are trying to differentiate themselves through their funerary practices. <laughs> so 
that we see funerary practices as a zone of debate, so to speak. So they're representative in that sense, but the actual practices that we're seeing here are actually really distinctive to the family. Most other Song clans don't bury their dead this way, as far as we can determine on the basis of the current archaeological record. So, um, uh, so it's, it's as a site, I don't think it's representative in, in that sense of a kind of overarching sort of Song notion of time. Um, but in, in terms of whether they're reading other, they're certainly reading other thinkers, they're certainly reading other classical texts, and they're trying to translate their interpretations into what they're doing in, in these, what they're doing with these funerary um, rituals and with these grave goods. Um, and I think the interest there is not simply using these objects as illustrations of what they're reading in those other texts, but as, in a sense, a sort of materialized exegesis on those texts. That we don't, I mean, most of the discussions that we have, the philosophical discussions that we have about ritual from the 11th century and based on the classical tradition, um, are, are, take place in um, you know, a, a sort of a highly abstract idiom. We don't actually know what that, what that actually means in practice. There's a lot of times saying one should emulate the ancients, but what in the world that actually means, uh, what practices that actually involves, is very rarely spelled out explicitly. And so I think what's interesting and exciting about this site is it actually gives us an opportunity to think how one family said, we're, we're, how one family went about the problem of putting it into practice, putting those abstract ideas into practice. Does that answer, sort of? It, is, it, it does answer, but what more specifically about time? So uh, oh, specific, okay. Um, <clears throat> so there are multiple definitions and understandings of time happening or that exist simultaneously in the song. Um, there is an understanding, as I was saying, of the ancient past as something that's distant from us, um, but that is also theoretically possible in the present, to renew in the present. There's a cyclical understanding of dynastic time, that every dynasty goes through a process, a process of rise and decline, and that follows a pattern, and that the, one of the things you do in studying history is recognize that pattern. Um, you can make the argument that all the official dynastic histories are about, in, in a sort of a overarching sense, about demonstrating that pattern of cyclical rise and decline. Um, and then there's, then there's also a chronological understanding of time, of a sort of progression of events leading up to the now, and then the now being the, the product of an evolution of all of those events. Um, and so I, it's not possible to reduce any set of objects that we have in the song to any one of those different definitions of time, because they, they seem to be operable, uh, broadly culturally operable, uh, throughout, throughout the period for most people. It's just a matter of sort of looking at which which of those definitions of time, or which of those understandings of time um, a, a given thinker is trying to emphasize in, in their work. So I tend to see much of this in the, sort of, in the realm of a kind of debate, basically fundamental debates that, that last throughout the song about uh, how we should understand how to be moral individuals and how time, and our understanding of time, plays into that. Those three bronzes that you showed uh, from Udani's tomb, yeah. if, were they illustrated in the Kabul Yeah, no. Okay. No, so unfortunately. Is there, is there a reason for that? Do you think? So this is so this is a so an interesting one interesting point that one might point, note is that for a family that was so interested in antiquities, uh, these are two Han Dynasty vessels and a Tang Dynasty vessel. These aren't, mm -hmm. I mean, those aren't ancient Shang and Zhou Dynasty bronze vessels. They're actually much more recent. They belong to a period that, in an, in an interesting way, isn't exactly the period that was most uh, celebrated um, in, in high antiquity. Uh, there are sort of various ways one could approach that question. I tend to think about it as an example of the fact that actually they're not very interested in the temporality of the objects themselves. That bronzes, ancient bronzes writ large get collapsed into a sort of single register of meaning rather than the kind of understanding that other scholars, certainly from the 12th century on, would, would articulate, which is that the key to understanding ancient bronzes is to organize them chronologically. Um, that's something that we don't see clearly, and um, that Kabutu is organized typologically rather than chronologically. Um, and uh, it's not something that we see emphasized a great deal in Ludovic's writings. He's certainly aware of different, the different periods of cer certain objects, but it doesn't seem to be something that he's actively emphasizing. And based on this sort of ritual use of this object, it's, it doesn't seem, we don't sort of see a sort of purism or pure, a sort of purist approach on the part of the family of saying, we're only going to use ancient Joe bronzes in our cemetery. They actually seem to be willing to use any ancient bronzes at all. Um, uh, and so 
The other thing is that most of the bronzes that Lou Dahlin includes in his catalog were not his bronzes. They were bronzes from other collections that he had visited and looked at, including most of the significant bronzes. Um, and these bronzes come from uh, a guy two generations after Lou Dahlin. Um, but let's go back here. Uh, these, the, the vessel on the left, which is the earliest vessel from the, from the cemetery, uh, comes from one of the third generation tombs. So that's clearly an object that they had in their possession. But we do not, there, there's no direct illustrations of that in, in the county tomb. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, can you say something about the broader context of all of this? Because it seems very, 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 well, it's family business almost, but it's, it's a very small discourse within a family. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering what is the implica the broader implication that we can say um, about this moment in time. Because it seems that it's a very crucial moment in time, both in terms of antiquarianism, collecting, collecting objects, yeah. writing about objects, brass rubbing, etc., etc., etc. All of this, I feel, could draw much broader conclusions than the, the specific family business. Um, That's so beautifully. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how would I answer that? The I guess what I would say is that. Uh, in the historiography of this period, there has been uh, a kind of overwhelming emphasis on mapping the sort of broad cultural contours of the period. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the 11th century was a key moment for the development of antiquarian thinking, and the first time that scholars sort of systematically began to rethink the information that they had learned in the classics on the basis of material objects right. that were coming right. out of the ground, that they were mobilizing material objects for, in, for the project of, of classical learning. Um, is you know, really well established in the field. We all sort of know that, that that was going on in the 11th century. Um, and, and I guess, from my mind, that my interest in this material is, is actually starting to think about what's going on in the song less in terms of sort of overarching cultural categories of meaning and more in terms of what are the kinds of questions, what are the kinds of problems uh -huh. that are actually motivating uh -huh. cultural behaviors. And so that what, we're, what I'm interested in doing and looking at the cemetery is seeing it as one response to a set of problems, and through looking at, th at that response, understanding what the problems were, like what were the sort of essential problems of, 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 of living yeah. in the 11th century if yeah. you were you know, a, a well-educated uh, literatus. And that's, to me, what's interesting about this site. You see, that as a 12th century person myself, uh, or beyond medieval West, mm. we talk about the discovery of learning, the 12th century Renaissance, when we talk something called, as, as a lot of something that comes out with the discovery and importation of other cultures, especially Islamic culture. Mm. Either science and medicine mm. or military crusades, right? Mm. All of these things are happening at the same time the West quote unquote discovers antiquity, discovers learning, although many scholars will show that the things that they discover they actually import from Islamic culture and dress it up in togas, so to speak, mm. to be uh, ancient culture. Mm. And that, that's why I'm asking, what is, the, what, is the, what is the trigger, what is the exterior trigger, maybe, well, if, to, if to, that, to that maneuver? I, uh, you know, I, I, come, I come from a scholarly tradition where any time one tries to generalize at that level, one is beaten down by one's colleagues. But I will, <laughs> I, I, what I, will, what I will, will say in answer to, to that question is that if you, if you force me to generalize, mm -hmm. um, that uh, that in fact what's happening in the 11th century is the mirror image of what you just described. That, that the Song is a period in which the kind of cosmopolitan court culture that was associated with the preceding Tang Dynasty has fallen away. Um, for ex I can give you a very specific example. In Zhang Mingcheng's uh, Jin Shilu, he includes a list of uh, 2,000 inscriptions. One of those inscriptions is from somewhere outside of the Song state, uh -huh. from Japan actually. And his comment is a simple, it's amazing, other people elsewhere make inscriptions too. <laughs> that's it. There's no interest in a sort of broader inscriptive mm -hmm. culture. There's a little bit of interest in stuff that's going on with the Tongas, but we do not see a kind of systematic in, in interest among 11th century literati with anything beyond the confines of the Song okay. state, mm -hmm. um, at least intellectually. You can, certainly there's evidence of other sort of cultural flows. I don't want to make be overly simplistic about it, but in terms of objects of intellectual interest, 
They're looking. They're looking to the past that they can dig up in their soil. Right. Right. Um, and you know, the 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 Lantia in that area there of Shanxi is the richest archaeological terrain in China today. Yeah. I mean, this was. They were the, these the, the bronzes of the ancient Zhou Dynasty were literally right. down their wells. Right. So you know, these were things that people were finding in their backyards. And and um, one of the things that. I think is interesting about the kind of claims that Song antiquarians make, and this is from the preface of uh, Ouyang Shou's Jigalu, is that he says very explicitly that these kinds of objects are just lying about everywhere, but no one takes them seriously. They collect them just like playthings, but instead we should look to them as sources of moral training, essentially. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that it's, it's, it's a, a, an attempt to push away Foreign influence. I mean, one of the key narratives that people associate with the rise of Neo-Confucianism, which is again an oversimplification, but is that it's partly an attempt to extricate foreign Buddhist practices from conventional classical Confucian practices mm -hmm. and sort of restore a sense of a pure pre-Buddhist Confucian tradition. And so that, I mean, I think in that way, it, it is actually quite different from what from what happens yeah. in the West. Thank you. That's a good way to. <laughs> <laughs>